We serve a God working in ways I don't think we can truly begin to grasp or understand. I'm excited today because we get to continue our study here in the book of Colossians. And we're continuing a sermon that I had a chance. We started last week, and you realize this preacher occasionally gets a little long-winded and started looking at the clock and realized, man, this could go till 2 o'clock. We're going to have to break this thing up. But today we get to continue this passage talking about the, the, the supremacy of Jesus, the preeminence of Christ, the power of Jesus. And what an amazing passage, because when we truly begin to grab a hold of it, when we truly begin to understand it, when we truly begin to embrace who Jesus is, it transforms everything about your life. It transforms how you approach each and every day. It transforms how you interact with the people around you. It transforms how you love your neighbors as yourself, how you worship his name in everything that you do. So today we continue our study here in the book of Colossians Colossians chapter one, picking up in verse number 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you and thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and grace, for your love and your mercy, for the hope that we have in you and the salvation that comes through Jesus alone. What a gift today to worship you, to lift your name high, to know that you are our only hope. Father, today many of us come into church here, this time of worship, and we carry burdens that weigh us down, that exhaust us, that overwhelm us. Father, help us to remember who you are. Help us to remember who Jesus is. Help us to remember the power and the strength that exists there, the hope that comes from following him, from surrendering to him, from being obedient to him. Lord, help us to set aside those things that distract us, those things that overwhelm us, those things that consume us. Help us, Lord, to put them to the side and embrace you alone, keeping our eyes on you. Father, we love you. We thank you. Forgive us of our sinfulness. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Fill this place in each of us with your presence, God, and may all that we do bring honor, praise, and glory to you. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. As I stated just a few minutes ago, we have an opportunity today to continue our study here in the book of Colossians chapter 1. And the question we're looking to answer once again today is how would you define him? Talking about Jesus. You see, we're looking at a very vital portion of scripture, one that speaks of the most important personality in the universe. We're talking about Jesus, the God of heaven revealed as the son. Understanding who Jesus is is the heartbeat of Christianity. It's the very essence of who we are as believers. This is the battleground over which we address false teaching, secular humanism, and everything that wants to discredit who Christ is and our responsibility as a church. The issue of the deity of Jesus is the issue being discussed here today. The one that we're looking at here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. We hit three points, and I'm going to review those here quickly in just a few moments and step into the last two points of that. But I just want to remind us of the context. You know, it's been said, the Bible, the Bible is the book about Jesus, And in a sense, that's very, very true when you break it down, when you begin to understand it. How do we know that? In the Old Testament, we have the preparation for Jesus coming. When you get into the Gospels, there's the presentation. Jesus has come. What a gift. What a blessing. When we get into the book of Acts, there's this proclamation. You have the message of salvation that is through Christ alone and how crucial that is for each of us to tell our neighbors about that. When we look at the letters, the epistles that were written in the New Testament, We study the way in which we are to follow Christ. How everything we do 
should emulate him, his love, his grace, his goodness, his truth, his righteousness, his holiness, his light. All of that should be reflected and shine through us. We understand, as Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And then we see in Revelation some crucial truth. One day, my friends, Jesus is coming back. One day, Jesus is coming back. I don't know about you, that kind of gets me pumped up. One day, Jesus is coming back and the whole world's gonna know. One day, he's coming back, not as a baby in the midst of the night. He's coming back to rule. He's coming back as the king of kings. He's coming back as the Lord of lords and everybody is gonna know who he is. Everybody is gonna proclaim who he is. In every sense, the Bible is about Jesus When you look at Acts chapter eight, verse 35, and this isn't just something we're talking about today. From the very beginning, this is something that's been talked about. You think of the story, Acts chapter eight, verse 35, Philip, he's talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember that story? Such a fascinating story. What's happening here? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. This Ethiopian eunuch was reading the scriptures. He was reading the text. He was reading the Old Testament. In fact, he was reading Isaiah. When you look at at Acts chapter eight, this is what it says he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation from his life is taken away from the earth. From this moment right here, Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, is telling him, this is Jesus who's come to give you hope. We look at Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Christ, after his resurrection, he's meeting the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Anybody remember the story of Emmaus? They didn't recognize Jesus initially. There was a burning within them, but they didn't recognize it. They didn't recognize who he was. I have to tell you, In January of this year, I had a chance. I was in Israel. And I'd never been to the location where they they believed Jesus went in to eat with the men on the Emmaus Road. And when you start talking about a distance and you start talking about traveling, you know, for us, traveling 11 miles is not a big deal, is it? You get in your car, and if you do the speed limit, you're going to be there in 11 minutes. Some of you drive a little faster. You're talking maybe eight or nine minutes. Imagine having to walk that. Imagine having to walk that having experienced what they had experienced, gone through what they had gone through in the days prior to that moment, Jesus resurrected, shows up to them, and he begins to share with them. Look at what he says. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus talked about himself with those men on Emmaus, and they didn't understand it. There was a burning within them. They knew something important was happening here. He goes into the house with them. Do you remember what happened? He breaks bread, and all of a sudden, boom, he's gone. And they knew instantly what it was. Do you want to know what they did in response to knowing it was Jesus? They didn't sit in the house and say, man, that was awesome. Although that would have been kind of cool, right, just to sit there. They didn't have the technology we have today. He couldn't, he couldn't get on there and tweet about it. He couldn't put it on Facebook. He couldn't put it on Instagram or social media. Do you know what they did in response to encountering Jesus? They got back up, and you know what the Bible tells us? They ran back to Jerusalem, 11 miles plus. When you encounter the living God, he's going to force you to move. When you have an encounter with God, there's a burning inside you, and you can't help it. You're going to respond to that. I've told you this before because I think it's so crucial. One of the things that people say about the reason they don't come to church is because church is boring. I tell them straight up, I love you. You do not know Jesus. You've never encountered him. If you can tell me it's boring. You have no idea who he is. If you can say he's boring because there's absolutely nothing boring about following Jesus. Have you recognized that? You take a little bit of time to get to know him and you spend time with him. And all of a sudden, you know what he's going to do? He's going to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone. And we don't like getting out of our comfort zones. That's why they're called comfort zones. Some of you, when you come into church on a Sunday morning, what do you do? You sit in the same exact pew that you've sat in for years. And if I were to ask you right now, hey, I want you guys to switch up next week, some of you are like, I'm not coming back next week. I'm not going to sit there. And it's so fascinating. We can tell when you're not here because the pew is open that day. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) 
We don't like getting out of our comfort zones, and yet God is going to call us to do that. Being obedient to him is going to stretch us. Why? You know, people will tell you, and I think this is interesting, and I love the songs that were presented today talking about the hope that we have in Jesus. Some people will, and and many of you I'm sure have heard this statement, that God won't give you any more than you can handle. If you ever say this statement, please stop making this statement. It is not a biblical statement. In fact, it is, a, it is a statement directly from the devil. You want to know why? Because in that statement right there, it says that you can handle all your circumstances and situation. I want you to understand that because Paul addressed it with the church in Corinth. He said, we have gotten to this point where we grieved. You know what it said? He said, we're grieving so much we want to die. Does that sound like things have gotten beyond more than you can handle? Absolutely. And this is the apostle Paul talking about that. Things are going to get more difficult than you can handle. That's okay because we serve a God who's far greater than everything you're encountering. We serve a God who's never failed. We serve a God who can't be defeated. We serve a God who has a purpose in every circumstance and every situation. And just because you don't understand it doesn't mean there isn't something good being worked out. In fact, it means you have to trust him. And yes, he's gonna stretch you. Yes, he's gonna make you uncomfortable. And what I love about God is he didn't ask our permission because he knows us far better than we do. He knows us far better than we do. He knows what it's going to take. And if we're truly honest, we understand that it's in the midst of hardship and difficulty. It's in the midst of the fiery furnace that we truly begin to grow. It's not in complacency. It's not in ease. And that's the problem I think we run into with the church in America is it's just gotten too easy. Come to church on Sunday morning, hang out for a little while, do your worship, go home, boom, we're done. But that's not what it's all about. Do you want to know why you come here today? You've come here because we're worshiping Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And if you haven't recognized who we're going to talk about here today, his name is Jesus. We're going to sing about him. We're going to talk about him. We're going to praise him. We're going to pray to him. We're going to rely upon him because we can do nothing apart from Jesus. And Paul wants them to understand that. You see, to a Jew in this day, the Old Testament's divided into three different sections. It's divided into to one part. You have Moses, that's the Pentateuch. You're talking the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Fascinating when we start addressing that. We talk about the prophets there, the, the second section. Those are the prophetic books given to them. And then you have the, 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 the scriptures, the, the sacred writings, which make up the books of the poetry and the history. And do you, you wanna know what Jesus does right here with those men on the road to Emmaus? He says all of this points to him. Every bit of it points to him. The Bible is about Jesus. And what we find here in this particular section is so crucial because it helps us grow in our relationship with him. Now, context matters when we talk about this. We remember the church in Corinth, uh, the, the church in Colossae was not started by Paul, although it had Paul's influence. Ideally, it was a man by the name of Epaphras who had come to see Paul while he's in prison, who now is, has started the church. And he's come to Paul and he's shared with him that there is a heresy that has emerged within the church right here. It's affecting the understanding about the deity of Jesus. It's affecting whether they truly grasp that he is the son of God, that he is God, that he is divine, that he is the only hope for salvation. This ideology has begun to emerge. And if we pay attention to it, it's a philosophy that began to erupt. It's called dualism, philosophical dualism. And what it means is this. This is the heresy that began to emerge in the church in Colossae. It means that all things spiritual are good and all things material are bad. So God is good because God is spiritual. Everything on the earth is bad because it is material. So therefore, Jesus cannot be God because what happens? This is God Spirit taking human flesh. Jesus can't be God because he's put on flesh. That means he would be evil. Now to us, when you look at all these passages and to Paul, he's like, no, 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 we can't do this. But they had bought into it. You see, they had grabbed a hold of this understanding that became the foundation for Gnosticism that said, look, God, who is spirit is good, began to to put out emanations. He began to put out spirits. And it was one spirit after another, kind of like ripples on a pond. And at first, all of the the spirits that were put out there were good. They're very good. They're very good. And then all of a sudden, they get neutral. And then they get neutral. And then they're neutral. And then they get bad. And then they get bad. And then all of a sudden, you have one of these bad emanations, these bad spirits that creates the earth. So God, who is spirit, is good, could not create the earth because the earth is bad. But one of these spirits that came on many, many, many zillions and trillions of times later on created the earth. And so Jesus who's one of the good spirits, and see, this is why they were really huge on angel worship. 
one of the good spirits, Jesus, is one who was pointing them to God, but he wasn't the only way. In fact, Jesus was there to help them get up, the, uh, up that ladder, kind of like rungs on a ladder. Just keep going until you finally get to God. All these things you had to do. And Paul's like, hold on. That's not what this is about at all. And how does he, be, he begins the letter by telling, look, I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful that you got the truth. I'm thankful that you understand the truth. I'm thankful that you paid attention to the truth. But now I want you to understand, I want, I'm praying that you have all the knowledge that you need to understand that Jesus is all that you need. And today in our culture, although many people will say Jesus is all that I need, we don't live like Jesus is all that we have. Because we're still trying to make it about us. We're still trying to make it about the things that we do as if somewhere along the way we could appease God enough that he would have to let us into heaven. There's this weighted scale. My father and I used to have this conversation all the time. My dad was 42 years old when he came to know Christ. My dad was a good man. My dad was an ENT. He was a locksmith, did some pretty amazing things. And he said, I can't tell you the number of times before he was 42 years old where he looks back now and knows that God saved him because he should have died. But he would, he would sit there. He said, all I thought it was, you had to be good. You had to be good. You had to be good. And I've shared this with you before. Many people will say, you know, I don't want to believe in a God who sends good people to hell. Anybody ever heard that? Maybe you've said that. I want you to understand something. I agree with you. I don't believe in a God who would send good people to hell. But here's a truth that I want you to grab a hold of because this is what the Bible says. There are no good people save one. And his name is Jesus. This is why understanding who he is, this is why understanding how he operates, everything about it is so crucial. Now, last week we began to talk to him, talk about him as creator. Everything was created by him, for him, and through him. There is absolutely nothing that exists today that he did not decide, decide should exist. You are here today, not by accident, not by chance, but by the sovereign hand of Almighty God. You are here today for a purpose. You know what that means? Because you're here for purpose, on purpose and God chose for you to be here. The person next to you is here because God wanted them to be here. Created in the image of almighty God, which means I'm gonna love you and I'm gonna respect you regardless of whether or not I always agree with you. I'm gonna love you and I'm gonna respect you. Why? Because you are created by God. You know, one of the travesties I think in the church is we too often forget how powerful the things we say are to the people around us. The Bible tells us very clearly there's death and there's life and the power of the tongue. Every person you encounter today, every person you encounter today is going through a struggle that they don't tell you about. I can see it on your faces here today. Many of you have a weight that no one else knows about, a burden. I'm sitting over here, we're singing. I'm like, I can't even get through a verse because I'm crying. I got tears in my eyes because you can feel the weight. And so many of us carry that weight and we don't talk about it with anybody else because our excuse is, I don't want to bother you with it. Don't use that as an excuse. That's the devil messing with you right there. We're a body of believers. We're a family coming here together. We do this together, but you know what? We don't do it in our own strength. We do it in the name of Jesus and we rely upon him completely and wholly without question. The question I have to ask you though is are we encouraging those next to us? Are we encouraging those around us? Are we encouraging those close to us? Your words matter. You've you've heard that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never what? Hurt me? That's not true either. Words hurt. And once you say them, you can't put them back. And sometimes apology, saying I'm sorry, doesn't fix it instantly. That's a reality we have to pay attention to. Our words carry weight. Now, I'm a words person. You talk about five love languages. Anybody ever done five love languages? You figure out what your, what your spouse's love language is? Gentlemen, I'm going to tell you right now. Find out what your wife's love language is and love her according to her love language Not yours. It's not going to work. I'm just throwing that out there. Let me tell you what, because I'll tell you the difference right here. I'm a words person. You know what that means? Tell me I'm doing good. Words of affirmation. Tell me I'm doing a good job. You will lift me up. Tell me I'm doing a bad job. You will tear me down. My wife is not a words person. My wife is quality time. If I go over to my wife right here and say, baby, I love you. You're amazing. You're so strong. and, And walk away from her. Do you know what she hears? You don't care about me enough to stay beside me. 
She doesn't hear all the wonderful things I just said because I meant them with all of my heart. I believe them with everything that I have. She's amazing. She's strong. She loves Jesus, and she is the greatest gift next to my salvation that the Lord has given to me. What an unbelievable thing. I can say those things to her, but if I want to love her appropriately, I've got to sit beside her. I don't have to say anything. I can just sit beside her because that right there says, I love you. Now, she understands two words matter to me. She can look at me frustrated and angry on her face and say, you're doing a wonderful job. (laughs) And all I hear is that I'm doing a wonderful job. That's all I hear. (laughs) I'm not reading in anything. All I heard was I'm doing a wonderful job. Thank you, baby. I love you. I can walk away with joy in my heart because that's all I heard were words. In the church, what we ought to be are people who love one another so much we encourage each other daily. When you came into the church this morning, did you look at somebody and say, I'm glad you're here today? Or did you walk into the church today waiting for somebody else to come and say to you, I'm glad you're here today? If you want to experience a transformation in your life and the joy of the Lord, you can't sit back and wait for somebody else to come to you. You've got to be willing to make that change and get out of your comfort zone. You can say, well, I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. Okay, that's great. God created you that way. But you can't isolate forever. You can't hide away forever. People matter. When you see somebody, it's, hey, I'm so glad that you're here. Mark chapter 14. You remember the story of that woman coming in there at at Simon the leper's house? And that woman comes in there and she breaks that alabaster jar. Do you remember that? She takes that that priceless perfume, breaks the top of that thing, pours it on Jesus' feet. When you combine all the gospels together, pours on his feet, pours on his head. Do you remember what the disciples said to her? They ridiculed her. They criticized her. They belittled her because of what she was doing. What was she doing? She was worshiping Jesus. In fact, she was doing the one thing that nobody else was doing. She was actually preparing his body for burial. Jesus had told them numerous times, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And they're like, no, 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 not really, not really. No, not you, Jesus. You can establish your kingdom. You don't have to do that. You know what she did? What she did? She took Jesus at his word and she brought the perfume in, the spikenard that's there. Now, understand how valuable this is. This is probably her dowry. This is her future. She's breaking it, saying there's nothing going back. She's saying, I'm submitting. I'm committing everything to you. And they ridiculed her for this extravagant act of worship. And I love what Jesus did for her. He says, boys, you need to stop it now. Because what she's done right here, every time we talk about the story, Every time they talk about me, wherever the gospel is preached, this story is going to be talked about. Can you imagine being the woman in the room at that point? Your Savior, your Creator just said, what you have done for me, the whole world is going to know about. Because of what Jesus said that day, we still talk about it. The blessing that was, that was given was right there. Now, let me ask you this. If the transcript of your life were read aloud right now, what would your words reveal? The negativity, the frustration, the nastiness that can emerge in a culture consumed by self-centeredness? Or would that transcript show you bragging on others, loving on others, praying for others? Where would you find yourself? How would you respond to that? Because we all need encouragement. You need to get back to looking at Abraham Lincoln. Gets shot in Ford's theater, dies a day, dies a day later. You know what's interesting about that story is they went through his pockets and they found some very interesting things. This is Abraham Lincoln, president of the United States, arguably one of the greatest presidents our country has ever had. Look at what was found On him, he was carrying two pairs of spectacles and a lens polisher, a pocket knife, a watch fob, a linen handkerchief, a brown leather wallet containing a $5 Confederate note, and eight newspaper clippings. That's a lot to be stuffed into your pockets there. I was intrigued by the eight newspaper clippings, and you know what's fascinating is pay attention to what they are. They They were articles written about him. 
And they were written in a positive way. You know what that means? Abraham Lincoln, whenever he got frustrated or got down or thought people were picking on him because he was one of the most criticized presidents that the country has ever seen. In fact, half the country didn't believe he was their president to begin with. He carried these clippings in his pocket so that when he was down, when he was frustrated, when he was overwhelmed with doubt and anxiety and fear and wondering if what he was doing was what he should be doing, he pulled that newspaper clipping out and he looked at it and he's like, all right. This person thinks I'm doing a good job. You know, I have a folder that I carry with me that has notes and letters from people I've had a chance to pastor over the last 14 years and their words of encouragement, and I go back every now and again to read through them. And I'm thankful for the people, and I pray for the people who wrote those notes and those letters because words matter. I told you a couple weeks ago, two things, parents, you tell your kids every day, I love you and I'm proud of you. You have no idea the impact that that has. I love you and I'm proud of you. We recognize him as creator. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver, so is a word skillfully spoken. Encourage somebody today. Encourage somebody this week. William Arthur Ward said this, about the things that we say and do. He said, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. Encourage me and I will not forget you. And then he goes on and says this, love me and I may be forced to love you. You have no idea the impact of positive words and actions. The second thing we looked at last week was the realization that Jesus is the head of the church. This, my friends, right here, Southern Calvary Baptist Church in Southern Maryland is not our church. Some of y'all tensed up on that right there. It's okay, we're gonna work through it. This is his church. This is the Lord's church. And if we forget that, we are heading down a path of destruction. This is about Jesus and everything that we say and everything that we do to bring glory to his name. And I love it because I tell people all the time, everybody likes to be a part of a winning team, don't you? It's hard, it's hard when your team loses for such a long time. I grew up being a Redskins fan. Y'all laugh because you can feel my pain right there. You're like, man, this is just rough all the way around. You know, last time they win the Super Bowl back in the 90s, I was in like middle school. You're like, good night. And it's funny now, you start talking about math, that was 30 years ago. When I think 30 years, I think 50s, 1950s. Now I'm like, wow, 1990s, they were so bad. And then all of a sudden, we just stopped going along. They start winning a few games. You've noticed this earlier this year, they started winning a couple games, people coming out of the woodworks. I'm like, you haven't been a Washington fan in 25 years. How about we not put that stuff on right now? But everybody wants to be a part of a guaranteed winner, don't you? Nobody's like, hey, let me join this team because they lose all the time. I'm pumped about that. No, we don't do that. I tell people all the time, you want to be part of a guaranteed winner, be a part of the church done the Lord's way. Because Jesus said very clearly, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. Which means he's going on offense. He's not sitting back waiting for the fight. He's stepping out knowing this is a spiritual battle, but he is going to win. We do it his way. He is going to transform lives. He is going to build his church. The third thing we looked at this is that he is the firstborn from the dead. He is the conqueror. And the songs we sang today just were the epitome of that. He is the conqueror. He has overcome death. He has overcome destruction. He has been raised from the dead. And he gives us hope because of that. He gives us hope because of that, the word used there, I think it's so good when he talks about firstborn from the dead, the word here is the word prototokos, firstborn. Doesn't mean the first in chronology. It means he is the preeminent one. He is the premier one. He is the life giver. He is the founder. He is the ruler. And we see that in description of Jesus over and over and over again. And he keeps going. Paul goes on right here as he says this. He says, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He points out in Philippians that that God raised him from the dead. He gave him a name which is above every name, the name Lord. And at that name, every single knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. One day, all of that is going to take place. By his resurrection, he has overcome death and fear. And yet too many of us live our lives consumed by fear. Why? I mean, think about that. 
Why are we so consumed by fear? And and we all battle it every day. I was battling it this morning, driving in here from Virginia. You're battling fear. You're battling the unknown. You're battling the uncertainty. Why? Because somewhere along the way, we thought we were still in control of the whole thing. Somewhere along the way, we thought that everything had to be filtered through our fingertips before it was taken care of. But what I love about Paul in this passage right here is he's talking about the supremacy of Jesus. We do not need to walk around living our lives consumed by fear. We need to walk around living our lives in confidence given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to a world that is in desperate need of him. That's the confidence that we need. That's the boldness that we need to proclaim him in every circumstance, in every situation, wherever we are, with whomever we are with, because God brought us there for a reason to make sure his name was glorified. Now, the fourth thing I want us to look at, that was just the introduction, so we'll we'll finish up a little bit later here today. Just kidding. This is point number four. The first thing we're we're really hitting to new here today, I want you to see here is this, because he keeps going. Colossians chapter one, verse 19. He is the one and only God, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The Bible tells us that Jesus is greater than all the other lowercase g gods. And you're like, hold on, preacher, I thought there was only one God. There is only one living God, but there are many false gods. The Bible addresses that over and over again. First Chronicles chapter 16, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, lowercase g, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The word gods, lowercase g, appears over 200 times. Over 200 times in the Bible. And the Lord wants us to understand that Jesus is the way. Other religions, other religious leaders will say this, follow me and I'll show you the truth. You know what Jesus said? I am the truth. Other religious leaders said, follow me and I'll show you the way to salvation. You know what Jesus said? I am the way to salvation. Other religious leaders said, follow me, and I'll lead you to enlightenment. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Other religious leaders said, follow me, and I'll show you one of the doors to God. Jesus said, I am the door. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are thousands of different religions in our world today. And in our age of tolerance, so many people try to say Jesus was merely a great man, a good teacher. But let's just be honest, that's not a viable option. C.S. Lewis said this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg or he would be the, he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Either you believe who he says he is or you don't. And I don't know about you, I want to believe who he says he is. And I have every reason to believe who he says he is because of his constant faithfulness in every circumstance and situation. Now, what does he say here? He talks about the fullness, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. What is the fullness of Christ? It is his grace. It is his truth. It is his love. It is his justifying righteousness, his forgiveness, his inheritance, his adoption, his sanctification, his holiness, his wisdom, his strength. That is the fullness, all of the fullness of Jesus. And when we have the fullness of Jesus living on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit, we have a peace that we cannot explain to a world consumed by darkness and not aware of him. But all of that exists in in Jesus. It wasn't granted to him as if he were created. It's who he is. That's his nature. You know, one of the things I've been doing is going through a Bible study throughout the week, teaching it online, talking about the names of God, the characteristics of God. There's not one single name that can encapsulate all that Jesus is, all that God is. All of these names come together and they give us a glimpse into a characteristic about who he is. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. You think about Abraham and Isaac. You start talking about all these other things. You talk about the fact that the Lord is my shepherd. For me, that is the one that has hit the hardest in the last several months. Why? 
Because when you read the 23rd Psalm, we oftentimes just gloss over it and move quickly because, hey, we've read it a hundred times. We've had it read to us a hundred times. We know this, and yet we forget that Jesus is doing something magnificent. Why? Because he's in it from the very beginning to the very end of the book. This is about the Lord, my shepherd, and Jesus is the good shepherd. You know what that means? He's going to make me lie down in green pastures. He's going to lead me beside still waters. He's going to restore my soul. I don't know about you. (laughs) When things are crazy in the world around me, that gives me a great sense of peace. Knowing that he's working in ways I can't even begin to grasp or understand. Chapter 2, verse 3, it says that in him, and this is in Colossians, and we'll get to this eventually, that are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all of them. Verse 10, in him, you have been made, look at this, complete. In Jesus, you are made complete. You cannot have it apart from him. You will not have it apart from him. The last thing I want you to see right here as we look at this section, as we're talking about the the supremacy of Jesus, the preeminence of Christ, it is this, Jesus is the restorer. He is the great restorer, verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We are all born with a problem. It's called sin. We are all born with a need of a savior. His name is Jesus. If you're feeling broken and empty today, the answer to the problems and the brokenness that you're feeling is Jesus. It doesn't mean life's going to get easy. In fact, if you follow Jesus, if you talk to anybody who's followed Jesus for any length of time at all, you're going to understand very, very quickly, following Jesus is going to make life more difficult. You're like, Pastor, I thought we were going to be encouraging here when we came to worship this morning. You told me following Jesus was going to be the most difficult thing that I'm ever going to do, and it will be, and it is, but you want to understand something? It's also the most rewarding because in him you're complete. In him, you have purpose. In him, you have reason for being. Why? Because you have been reconciled to him. The word reconcile here means to bring together. It means to agree. The familiar term for reconcile in the Bible is the word kataleso. It's used two times in the New Testament. And I'm I'm telling you what the word is because I want to show you the word that was used in this particular passage that Paul addresses here. We find it, the regular word, kataleso, talking about to reconcile in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Romans chapter 5. In both of those passages, what he's doing is he's just simply helping you to understand what Jesus does. He reconciles you back to the Father. He gets you in agreement with the Father. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus right now, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord right now, if he is not your personal Lord and Savior, he's just somebody you know about, understand me when I tell you this, you are not in right relationship with God, period. But you have hope. And that can be fixed here today. That can be addressed here today as you surrender to him. Now, the term used here in Colossians, the one that Paul uses here, it's not kataleso, it's apo kataleso. Anytime you use or add something like apo, you're adding a preposition to it. It intensifies the word. So why in the world would Paul use apo kataleso right here? Because in the first two passages I just shared with you in in 2 Corinthians and in Romans, He's not addressing a battle. He's not addressing a heresy that's there. But when you're in Colossians, he's emphasizing very clearly, very quickly, you have a problem with heresy that has emerged, but I want you to understand it's almost as if he's giving exclamation points over and over and over again. Apo kataleso, he is the one to reconcile you. He is the one you need. He is the one you follow. He is the one you surrender to. He is the one you allow to transform you. He is the one you allow to make a difference in your life because only he can do it. That's what Paul is saying right here. Apo kataleso, he can reconcile you. Let him reconcile you because the battle going on right now is leading people astray. The battle in Colossae right now is leading people astray. You know, in all of this, when we look at all of this, you ask the question, how would you define him? How would you define him? Do you recognize his supremacy? Do you recognize the supreme nature of Christ? Do you recognize the unbelievable power of Christ over all things? One writer said this, talking about Jesus, he is sovereign and he is supreme over all plants and animals, 
From the peaceful blue whale to the microscopic virus, he is supreme over all weather and all movements of the earth, hurricanes, tornadoes, monsoons, earthquakes, floods, snow, rain, sleet. He is supreme over all chemical processes that kill or destroy cancer, AIDS, malaria, flu, COVID, and all the grace of the healing antibiotics that he has blessed us with. He is supreme over all countries and governments and armies. He is supreme over all nuclear threats, over politics and elections and debates, media, news, entertainment, sports, and leisure. He is supreme over all education and universities. He is supreme over all scholarship and science and research. He is supreme over all business and finance and industry and transportation. He is supreme over the internet and all the informational systems. There is not one square inch on planet earth where the risen Christ does not say, that is mine, I rule it. That is who Jesus is. So how would you define him? Because you see that It really doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what C.S. Lewis says. It doesn't matter what other preachers say. The question is, do you believe what the Bible says? Because that's what it says about him. He's not one of many spirits guiding us along the way. He is the one who makes us complete. He is the one who gives us purpose and hope. He is the one who can transform our lives in an instant. The question is this, are you going to believe it? You ask the questions, was he a religious charlatan who launched a conspiracy still fooling millions today? Was he a demented man who had delusions of being God? Or is he the king of kings and the Lord of lords? You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You know what it says? You shall be saved. It doesn't say, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth and then going to do, out, do, do all these wonderful good works, trying to earn God's favor. Do you, does it blow your mind that you can't get God to love you any more than he loves you right now? And he loves you so much, he sent his son to die for you and for me. Where do you find yourself here today? Battling him, ignoring him, turning away from him, frustrated, thinking, man, this guy needs to shut it down because I got to go to lunch? Or are you willing to just simply surrender to him and say, Father, I will do whatever you say? It begins with repentance. You know, A.W. Tozer said this, and I'll close out with this when you think about it. And this was over 50 years ago, over 50 years ago. He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. That's the problem that we find in churches today. And then he goes on, he says this, if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. You know, when you look at the the book of Judges, one of the most terrifying passages for me, anybody remember the story of Samson? How do we remember Samson? What do you remember? Talk to me for a second. How do you remember Samson? Always long hair, right? Who, Who else do you think of with him? You think about Delilah, you think about strength, you think about, man, this guy was magnificent. Hey, if you get to the end of the story there with Samson, it's a pretty fascinating one because he's there with Delilah, which was a mistake anyway. But let's just be honest. She tried to kill him four times. My question, because I got a lot of questions when I get to heaven. I'm like, Samson, after the first time you thought, hey, let's, let's continue this relationship? Like after she had the Philistines come in the first time, you're like, hey, let's just give her another shot. And the second time, you're like, oh, no, we're fine, we're good. Third time, are you kidding me? Finally, she gets the truth out, it's your hair. But you know the terrifying part of that passage for me is this, because see, Samson knew the spirit of God was with him. That's where he knew where his strength was. He wasn't coming at this naive. He wasn't coming at this thinking it was him. This was the spirit of the living God. But you know what happened after she cut his hair? The Philistines are coming in. The Bible says Samson got up. And you know what it tells us? He did not know that the spirit of God had left him. That's my greatest fear. Lord, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. Lord, whatever I say, whatever I do, let it be from you. Please don't leave me. And too many churches today have no idea the spirit of the living God has left the building. 
because they don't worship him. They don't proclaim his goodness. They don't talk about repentance. They don't mention the word hell. You don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to address sin because it might make people uncomfortable. Hear me when I tell you this. Diving into the word of God is going to make you uncomfortable, but understand something. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about his holiness. And so today, you want to get right with Jesus? It's time to repent. You want to draw closer to Jesus? It's time to have a conversation because I'm going to tell you something. Showing up to church doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing Jesus, truly knowing Jesus, having him transform you, that's what matters the most here in following him. You know, if you've never given your life to Christ, today is the day. This is the moment. This is the time. My question to you is this. What are you holding on to so tightly that you think it's going to matter a thousand years from now? Because apart from Jesus, nothing is going to matter a thousand years from now. You've read the book of Revelation. We know how this ends. There's a lot of fire. There's a lot of destruction. Thank the Lord. I don't think we're going to be here to see it. But that's another sermon for another day. If you need to follow him in baptism, again, what's holding you back? Not because baptism saves you. Baptism's not what saves you. Jesus saves you. Baptism is an act of obedience. Pastor Brad told me it takes, what, 40 minutes to fill that thing up, right? And and there's plenty of water. I mean, my goodness, we're right around it. Yes, it'll be freezing. But if you want to go in, I'll go in with you. But today's the day where you follow him. Maybe you need to join in with what's going on here. Pastor Brad, a couple of our deacons will be here. This is an opportunity. Maybe you just need to come and pray. Maybe you need to come to the altar and you need to to let go of the burdens that are consuming you. Or you just need to come and praise his name for how good he is. Because he is good. He is holy. He's righteous and he is just. Whatever you need to do today, now is the time that we do business with the Lord. And we don't walk out of here saying maybe next week. Because I'm going to tell you, friends, you may not have next week. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. My friends, you are as close to Jesus as you want to be. How close do you want to be? That is entirely up to you. But choose wisely because your eternity is at stake. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you and thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for for the love that you give to us and the salvation that comes through Christ alone. What a gift. What a blessing. God, I thank you for this time of worship we've had this morning to lift your name high. Help us, Lord, to take the message of hope presented to us, the name of Jesus, and proclaim it to a world that's in desperate need. Help us to, Lord, embrace the challenge in front of us to encourage somebody around us, to encourage a neighbor, to invite somebody to come to worship with us again next week, Lord, to to share the gospel with somebody we encounter this week, because nothing, no one we encounter, Lord, it's not by accident that we're going to run into them. You've allowed that. And so, Lord, help us to embrace it. God, I thank you for this body of believers. I thank you for this worship team. I thank you for our tech folks. I thank you for our deacons, for our trustees. I thank you for our Sunday school, our our connect group teachers. I thank you, Lord, for those working with our children in the back right now. I thank you for those who volunteer on a regular basis. I thank you, God, for for how you're working, for, for recognizing for those who recognize who you are. God, help us to serve you without question, without hesitation, without reservation. Let today be the day that we say yes to you no matter what. Forgive us of our sinfulness. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness, almighty God, and may all that we do bring honor, praise, and glory to you. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.